Thank you. I'm, I'm both honored and pretty much freaked out about being here because I'm, <laughs> I'm such a big fan of TED. I use it in my classrooms all the time. It, it's very inspiring. So I'm pretty freaked out about having to be inspiring myself. Um, I want to talk to you about, introduce you to some people who've been inspiring to me. And I want to give you a little bit of a challenge that might wreck your whole day. But before I get to that, I want to talk about my favorite subject, and that's myself. <laughs> I grew up in North Dakota, and, um, and, and that's a map, and that's the funniest map I could find of North Dakota. Um, I found it on a Russian website. And the reason I, I put it up, and we could talk all we wanted about North Dakota dental health professional shortage areas. I'm sure it's a big issue, but we're not going to talk about that today. What I want, my point is that I got that off a Russian website that, that said I could use that for free, all I wanted. And I'm sure that they can't use it for free. But I thought that was interesting. Because when I grew up in North Dakota, um, and if you want to know what North Dakota is like, just step outside into the 50 mile an hour gale winds uh, that we have. But as I was growing up in North Dakota, once uh, in the 70s and 80s, I had a very narrow view of the world. North Dakota doesn't lead the nation in very much. Well, it does now because it has a surplus and because they're fracking the heck out of North Dakota. But we were lowest in teacher pay. We were lowest in econ economy. We were very low on lists. It was very depressing. But we're very high on being the whitest state in the world. Okay? <laughs> we're the ninth whitest state. And I had a very narrow vision of the world. Going to Minneapolis was like going to London or Cairo for us. Minneapolis was it, man. Okay, so growing up there, you ended up, you ended up being, looking like this. And every, every year, your hair got a little longer and back until you ended up with a mullet. And the reason that was is because the only TV available to us were the network television stations. We didn't have cable back then in the 70s, so we didn't have a lot of diversity in what we saw. Um, so I grew up, the only diversity I saw was on Good Times and the Jeffersons, but mostly I watched Archie Bunker. And, my mom let me stay up late to watch Three's Company. Uh, and then on Wednesday nights, it was Charlie's Angels. I could stay up a little later to watch that. So that was diversity to me, Charlie's Angels. On the radio, I had three choices, because I didn't know there was an NPR station. And I didn't know that Big Bird was, was in jeopardy back then. So uh, we, we could listen to country music. You know, The Devil Went Down to Georgia. Um, we could listen to classic rock, uh, which was Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd. Probably great bands, but I don't ever want to listen to them again. And we can listen to Top 40, as much Lionel Richie as your brain could take. Okay, And that's who I was. And so diversity wasn't a word that we even knew, much less understood, much less understood what we could, you know, how it could give us an advantage or a niche in life to understand it and to live it. So what was diversity to us growing up in North Dakota? It was kind of like this. What in the hell's diversity? <clears throat> well, I, I could be wrong. But I believe uh, diversity is an old, old wooden ship that was used during the Civil War era. Ron, I would be surprised if the affiliates were concerned about the lack of an old, old wooden ship. But nice try. Uh, diversity means the times are changing. And with that in mind, Ron, are you paying attention? Nope. Well, this concern. So as Michael, as Michael Moore once pointed out, North Dakota is the least visited state in the union, yet tourism is our number two industry. <laughs> so what that meant was we went to a lot of sporting events, we listened to a lot of Pink Floyd, and our mullets just kept growing like that. Okay? So I went into the world. I went to university in North Dakota, where there were a lot of people who looked like me. I worked in Minnesota with a lot of people who looked like me. I worked in Colorado with a lot of people who looked like me but were healthier than me. And then. <laughs> I decided that I wanted to open up my world a little. So I moved from the ninth whitest state in the union to the 10th. Oops. Oh, by the way, before that, going to Minneapolis, I met Prince. I didn't meet Prince. I got an album by Prince. And that made me, made me one of the most diverse people in North Dakota. OK? <laughs> And that's not to say that we didn't have people who didn't look like us. We had Native Americans, vibrant Native, Native American communities, the only uh, counties that were growing in North Dakota and doing really meaningful things were the Native American communities, but we were so in a different world from them that we never came across them, which was sad. So I moved from the ninth most white state to the 10th. <laughs> right? I needed to grow in my diversity. All right? But there are pockets in Nebraska, and there are pockets in Lincoln where you can really learn a lot about the world. And UNL is one of them. And I mainly learned that from the first boss I had. I came to UNL to get a master's degree in English to become a great novelist, to become the next John Steinbeck. What I found instead was Will Norton, who was more inspiring to me than even John Steinbeck. 
Will Norton was the dean of the journalism school here. He was an amazing man. He grew up as a missionary kid in Africa, and he cared about the world, and he was magnetic to other people who cared about the world, and he believed that all the problems in the world were all problems based on poverty in the world, and that's what caused war, that's what caused conflict, that's what caused economic failure and disaster, okay? So in my job as a professor at, of journalism, I thought, yeah, this is gonna be another three-year teaching gig. I get bored real easy in my narrow focus of what the world's about. And I never held a job longer than two years and nine months. And now I'm in my eighth year and I wanna tell you why I've been here for eight years. It's because Will Norton made a difference in my life and taught me that there was a whole other world out there that I didn't know existed. It started with, he sent me to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And he had me teach master's students there. And I only had to do that for about four hours a day. So I went out and I experienced the culture. I taught in high schools where the rich kids were. I taught in high schools where the poor kids were. And I found out that a lot of the issues that people cared about in Ethiopia were similar to the issues that people cared about in Lincoln or in North Dakota, okay? And that was very powerful to me. I also got to hang out in an HIV orphanage, okay? Which really had an impact on my life. Meeting these kids who knew that they were not gonna live for two or three more years. Okay, it really made me change how I felt about HIV, how I felt about Africa. But there was also a third thing that happened to me that really impacted me. I was really disappointed in my president in those days, and my president then was George W. Bush. And I was really hard on him. But I found out when I was over there the impact that George W. Bush was making on these kids, because not only did he send drugs that helped keep these kids alive, but he went way beyond what Africa even asked for. And I realized that I can't treat people like that. I can't have uh, uninformed decisions that, that paint how I feel about any issue. That I need to learn more and I need to, need to see the other side, okay? And that was important to me. So important to me, upon meeting a kid like Layla, who really changed my life, and I knew I wasn't ready to adopt her and bring her back home, because I knew my family wasn't ready for that yet. So instead, I mentioned to the woman who had us come over, it was a woman from the Norwegian government, how, God, I really wish I could bring my kids over. And she said, yeah, I bring my kids to Ethiopia all the time because it changes who they are. And I said, man, I wish I could afford that. And she said, you know what? We'll call it uh, an entertainment expense. We'll pay for your daughter to come over. And that changed who she was and it changed her life. Not only did she get to meet and play with these kids who have HIV, but she got to meet the kid that she had been sponsoring for five years through a Compassion International, you know, saving her dimes, saving her quarters, our family saving our money to sponsor a kid. She got to meet that kid, and that changed her. I don't know if it changed her that day, but I think it's gonna paint who she is for the rest of her life, okay? And so that was a powerful experience for me, Ethiopia, to the point that we're gonna bring 20 kids there in May from our school, so it can change them too. Then he sent me to a place called Kosovo that I had only heard of on the news in short briefs that I saw on the inside of the Lincoln Journal Star, the inside of the, of the Omaha World Herald. And in Kosovo, I found a lot of interesting things. The main thing was that I was in the middle of history happening. And I'd always been a fan of history, and I'd always been frustrated that history books were so boring. Because these should be the greatest acts and greatest thoughts by the greatest and most horrible people ever. Shouldn't it be exciting, right? Okay, but history had never come alive to, for me until I went to Kosovo. They're the youngest nation on earth and the poorest nation in Europe. 40% unemployment, five times what we have here and we're freaking out about it, right? So it made me realize this is what history looks like when it's happening. This was year one of Kosovo. And what was really amazing about it is I had a lot of opinions about Bill Clinton. You guys remember that guy? And what do we remember him for? I can't ask you, I'm supposed to be giving the speech, so I'll stop asking questions. But you know what you remember him for. But in Kosovo, there's a building that's five stories tall, one of the biggest buildings in, in Pristina, the capital of Kosovo, and it has a poster of Bill Clinton, full length. You wouldn't see that in Arkansas, right? <laughs> and why do they love him? They love him because the driver who took me from the airport in Kosovo named Ilir was a KLA fighter for the Kos Kosovo Liberation Army. He said that when they were being bombed and things were, were when, when Serbia was coming down in that war, in that civil war that they had before they became Kosovo and got their independence, he was eating dirt in the mountains. He didn't know if his family was alive or dead. And then he heard Bill Clinton's bombs. And then he loved Bill Clinton. Like there's a pocket out there that loved Bill Clinton at a time when nobody loved Bill Clinton, okay? And it changed how I felt about where and when we go out in the world and try to change things. There's a place that loves that we did that. And I hadn't heard of that before. 
And it was very interesting to me. I met Muslims there, okay? I hadn't had a lot of contact with them before Ethiopia, and I found a different kind of Muslim there than the, than the Muslim I saw in Ethiopia, who shared churches with Christians and get along with Christians in Ethiopia. And I met people, families, that care about their kids the way we care about kids here in Lincoln, Nebraska, throughout Nebraska, in Omaha. And I also found that even people who have 40% unemployment, they know how to party. <laughs> they hang out in coffee shops all day because they don't have jobs. And then at night, they go out and have fun because they're not going to just sit and complain about their problems. They're going to enjoy their lives, and they're going to try to do something about them. So we pulled into this jazz club, Jerry Renault and I. Jerry's a little bit older than I am. And at this famous jazz club, the owner comes to us and says, are you sure you want to be here tonight? And we said, yeah, we want to be here tonight because we're out with our students that we've been teaching for three weeks, trying to help them develop a media in Kosovo that's the fourth estate so that the other three estates work in this developing democracy. And they want to take us out to thank us. A teacher being thanked by a student? It was weird, OK? <laughs> And so they took us to the Jazz 212 Club. And at the Jazz 212 Club, the owner came to us and said, you guys may not want to be here because we have a Bulgarian punk band tonight. And we said, well, we're, we feel obligated to the students. We're going to stick around. Don't worry about us. And he said, OK, but you won't like it. And the first song that that Bulgarian punk band played was Gnarls Barkley's Crazy. <laughs> and the students went crazy. The people went crazy. And we went a little bit crazy. And you're not going to believe what the second song was. This isn't an actual video of it, because I should have had a video camera, but this is the song. <laughs> the second song was Lionel Richie's Easy Like Sunday Morning, <laughs> played with heavy distortion by a Bulgarian no, punk band. Funny, and I realized that North Dakota thing. isn't so far away from everything else, maybe. <laughs> So the next year, we brought students over there because we were changed by that experience, and we wanted them to be changed by that experience. And Karen Schmidt, a wonderful kid from Lincoln, she has concerns. She has big issues that she cares about in life. And one is she cares about the disabled. And she met this woman who's disabled who was dropped off by her family at this institution and left alone forever. Okay? And she listened to that woman's story and told that woman's story and made a difference in that woman's life. And everybody she shares that story with, it makes a difference in, in their lives and changes how they feel about the disabled. She did the same thing with the elderly, who often are forgotten in Kosovo, because Kosovo is about the future, not about the past, because the past hurts, right? And she told their story. We had another student from Omaha named Vanessa, who did stories of, about um, the Serbians who are stuck in Kosovo now, and now they feel like the minority, and they feel like everybody blames them when they didn't do anything wrong. It was the politicians, OK? And that family was too scared to talk to her and ditched her on the interview. And on the way back from that two-hour ride on the scary roads of Kosovo, she saw a funeral procession and had to wait for it. And she had the guts, the courage, to get out of her car with her camera and walk up to that funeral. And a guy who was the mayor of that town, called himself the mayor, they pushed her to the front. And she documented the death of a 12-year-old girl who got hit by a car and died that day. And according to the ethnic Albanian custom, they have to bury their dead that day. And the whole village stopped what it was doing and got together to try to help the mom, you see in the upper right-hand corner there, to help her through that. That changed Vanessa. And Kosovo changed all of us. The third place that they sent us to, or that Will Norton sent me to, or the following deans did, was India. And India is daunting, folks. India is hard. It's not like the India you see in Slumdog Millionaire which is supposed to look hard, but doesn't look that hard. It looks way too pretty. India is a beautiful, wonderful culture. It's the biggest democracy on Earth. But a lot of people are forgotten in that democracy on Earth. Women are forgotten. Okay? The poor are forgotten. The victims of caste are forgotten. And our students didn't hang out at the Taj Mahal. Okay? They didn't hang out at the Hilton. They did not hang out at the Hard Rock Cafe. Instead, they had to live for three weeks the way you have to live in India if you are one of the have-nots. Okay? And that changed our students. And they found out what it was like to look different from everybody else and be the minority. And what that meant every day to have to get up to that. And they made relationships that changed their lives. And this is the project that we just finished last May. I am in this rickshaw that you're going to see, and I thought I was going to die.
And those students hung out in leper colonies. They hung out with heroin addicts who were doing drugs and walked around with needles that were infected. 30% of these guys have AIDS. And those students found out what it was like to be those people who were the have-nots in India and what their lives were like. But the students decided, hey, this isn't fair. Just because we get to go on this trip, we shouldn't be the only ones who are having our world widened, our perspective widened by this. So they put on a show of their best stories at the Ross, and they filled that theater because people in Lincoln have a thirst to have their, their, their scopes widened and to see the world. And now they're going to bring it to another theater in Lincoln, they're going to bring it to Omaha, and they're going to share it hopefully all around the, the country, what they learned, because everybody should have their scope widened. And that was what India was for us. And so what I want to do is I want to introduce you to a couple people who have made a difference with what they've learned about the world. This is a guy named Mark Johnson, and he looks like pretty much anybody, but, and he has a pretty ordinary name. But what's interesting about Mark Johnson is that he's good at some things. He's a music producer, a filmmaker, and he's, he loves the world. He loves to travel the world. So what does he do with that? He starts an NGO called Playing for Change, which using his music abilities and his abilities on YouTube, he starts schools all over the world because music is a universal language to get people to improve their lives, to try to make a difference in the world. Another person like Mark is a woman I met named Jessica Mayberry. She was a broadcaster in New York who didn't think she was making a difference in her life, in people's lives, like she wanted to. She had skills as a businesswoman. She has a high sense of social justice. She loves the world. She moved to India. She got married, started a family, and started an NGO called um, Video Volunteers, which has a show called India Unheard, in which they have women who have no voice in the media or in India. They have women tell their stories in their villages. No matter what caste you are, they get their stories out there, and it's causing change in India. Andrew is one of the students who went with us to Kazakhstan, to Kyrgyzstan, to India, and had his life changed. Now, he is not just going to be some kid from Kansas City who grew up in middle class. He takes his yearbook editor skills, his photography skills, his multimedia journalism skills, his sense of social justice. He goes from being a yearbook editor who builds you know, content that's good looking but doesn't make any difference in the world. He goes to the beach, gets good at photography, and then he goes with us to Kazakhstan to tell the story of somebody like that who has hopes and dreams similar to Andrew's. And he, now Andrew is going to go out on the market when he graduates in a year, and he's going to make a difference in the world. Just like graduate Elisa Miller, UNL graduate, has done. She runs PRI. She's the CEO of PRI as a Nebraska grad. We can make it from Nebraska, right? OK? And from that place on the game board and all her skills, she, five years ago, even did a TED talk on this. She says the news media in the US, if you only pay attention to the US news media, you will end up with a world that looks like that. And that's a problem, which gets back to diversity. Matt Damon got crucified when he said, I think many of our problems as a country would be solved if people had thicker passports. There's just no substitute for actually doing things. He got crucified as an elitist for that. But I know journalists like this guy, whose life was changed when Joe Street, our professor here, told him that he had to go out and see the world. And he went from being a small town sports reporter to interviewing George Clooney for Esquire. And the best magazine writer in the world, Gary Smith, he said, seeing the world is what made me deeper, bigger, better, and deeper, which makes my content better. So what does this all mean? My challenge to you real quickly is I want you to write down three things that you're good at, three things where you can make a difference in the world, think three things you care about, three things that you're really good at, your niches in the world. I want you to write down three places you'd love to go in the world to see what the world is like. And then all I want you to do, as Seth Godin said in his TED Talk, is and it only takes 24 hours, go start a movement. Thanks for listening to me today. <laughs>